Welcome back to the Canadian Rock. This is Jamie Gray. This pod, we welcome Matt Tierney. Matt's a tough front row prop with 20 appearances for Canada. His first cap came for Canada back in 2016 against Russia. He was a member of the 2019 Rugby World Cup squad that uh, ventured into Japan, spent three seasons with Pau in France, and he's currently toying for, toiling for the Cast Olympique over in France with Tyler Ardron. So stay tuned because Matt will be coming up very soon. Soon before we get there, though, just some of that contact information, just a little plug for ourselves here. Make sure that uh, if you're on the Twitter, you're following us. If you're on Instagram, you're following us. If you're on Facebook, you're joining our club. And if you want to contact me, you can use any of those platforms or you can send me an email to CanadianRock at gmail.com. Always, too, though, remember watching and listening. Awesome. Love it. Make sure you're following, subscribing, and sharing. All right, we're on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and CastBox. That's our anchor program. And if you're unsure of where to go, always just, just rely on our website, which is the thecanadianruck.weebly.com. All right, before we move on to Matt, we've got a little bit of rugby news that we want to look at. There's some uh, controversial things that have happened. As you probably all know by now, this one's been out for a little while, but Canada's women's sevens and John Tate. Uh, it's, it's been out, but it's still stuff that needs to be talked about. As we all know, John Tate has stepped down due to allegations of bullying and harassment from the players on the Sevens women's team. He's been cleared to resume his post as coach and high performance director and by an independent third party arbitrator, but he has stated he has no interest in returning. He quite clearly is upset and hurt by these allegations. But the women on those teams are visibly hurt too, as 37 of them filed this report. Women feel they have been let down by Rugby Canada's bullying and harassment policy. The third party stated there were no violations of harassment or bullying under Rugby Canada's policies and guidelines. Rugby Canada is now undergoing an investigation into their policy to look for areas that need updated, stating it should start around the time of the Olympics, so a couple months out. There's been lots of social media posts from the women stating why now. So I follow most of these women, uh, especially the ones that I've had on my pod, uh, you know, Karen Peck, Am, Magley, Harvey, and it, it's just one of those things that it's it's popping up and I'm, I'm just more keen and interested in finding what's going on. But the why now is what they're starting with and it, basically what they're doing is they're looking to add empowerment to the players, showing their solidarity towards a respectful environment so that they can be good ancestors of the game. I'm sure this isn't over yet, but I just really hope that everybody can move forward with a sense of peace um, towards towards the great game of rugby. Also, this is pretty cool. This is a good one. I like this one here. Rugby is superior to football. Yeah, I mean, to me, it goes without saying, but I guess there's some arguments and merits both ways. A great article from student Noah Wright in the newspaper The Observer out of Central Washington University, citing great thoughts on why rugby is better than football. The two main points that he focused on in the article were one, safety, and two, on availability. So these are the author's thoughts on safety. In rugby, there are no pads to cushion the collisions. The only pieces of required equipment, other than your body and your mind, are a mouthpiece and clothing. As a result, the contact in rugby is not as big. The contact is much more frequent, but you aren't going to hear any loud, no loud hits or see someone lifted off their feet because the players are always thinking of ways to be physical while also protecting themselves. Another reason rugby is safer is because there are rules in place at all levels to protect the players. In rugby, contact is a non-negotiable area of law. We have a penalty that is known as a high tackle. Any contact above the ribs is constituted as a high tackle and players run the risk of ejection due to the penalty. In football, the contact area is a free-for-all, with people flying in from every direction. There are few, very few rules to stop players from seriously injuring opponents. I like those thoughts. And this is uh, the author's thoughts on availability. With football, there's really only the NFL and CFL for athletes who want to play professionally. As a result, many college athletes will spend years of their lives devoted to the sport just to have it end with college. Rugby, on the other hand, is professional leagues all over the world. There's Super Rugby New Zealand and Australia, top leagues in Japan, Premiership in England, and many more. U.S. and Canada created professional rugby, the MLR, in 2017. For women, rugby is a sport that they can play and succeed in as well. Unlike football, which is a male-dominated sport, women's rugby is available from youth age to the professional levels, with many schools having a women's rugby team. Beyond college, men's and women's rugby is also an Olympic sport meaning athletes have the chance to represent their country on the world stage playing rugby, something unavailable with football. 
It's great writing, Noah. Like you, you, you summarize some really key traits as to why rugby is superior to football. Great thoughts. Football is a cool sport. I'm not arguing that, but not nearly as impressive as to what rugby can bring. The inclusivity, camaraderie, community, as Matt Tierney touches on, are some of the areas where rugby dominates other sports. Thanks for writing this, Noah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you get a lot of readers and, uh, you know, maybe convert some or even just get more people exposed to the game. Well done. Also internationally, this is um, not, not a great story, but hopefully there's a silver lining at the end. Player on life support. James Lassus, a 25-year-old playing for Stade Nicoa in France, suffered a serious neck injury when a scrum, scrum collapsed a few days ago. He underwent emergency surgery, and the team has stated that he is still in worrying condition. His mom stated that he can't move, move, breathe on his own, or feed himself yet. She watched the game and incident live on TV, and it was about a 20-minute process as she saw the scrum collapse with his boots stuck up in the air. Doctors are hopeful he'll resume breathing on his own once his neck stabilizes. Mom said he's communicating through blinking, so that shows signs of brain activity, which is obviously hopeful. A Just Giving page has been set up for donation, which has raised over 15,000 euros so far. And there's another online site that has raised over 10,000 euros. Canadian Ruck is praying for a full recovery and strength for you and your parents during this tough battle that you are going through, James. We're here praying for you, buddy. And in the MLR this weekend... Saturday games have happened. This is Sunday morning. Josh Larson, Josh Larson and his Free Jacks uh, beat up on his brother Travis in the San Diego Legion 33-17. to And then Old Glory DC was in LA where the high-flying Giltinis and that high-octane offense were on full display again with a 47-17 win. Today, there's two matches. Your Toronto Arrows or New Orleans to face off against the NOLA Gold with kickoff at 1 p.m. Eastern on TSN2. And Rugby United New York is in Seattle to square off against the Seawolves at 8 p.m. Eastern. That match is on the Rugby Network. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Look no further than East Coast Roast Coffee, which is an independent microbrewery, <laughs> micro coffee roaster in St. John MB. What microbreweries are to beer, East Coast Roasts is to coffee. They source from independent farmers and co-ops all around the world and roast in small batches to bring something interesting to the local coffee scene. If you're into really fresh coffee, Head on over to their site at eastcoastroast.ca or pick up beans from Jeremiah's Paris Crew, the Art Warehouse, or Woodchucks in St. John. Coming up now, Matt Tierney. Canadian Rock welcomes this week Matt Tierney. Matt, uh, he's playing over right now for Castover in France, and he's uh, he's just a young, tough front row prop, but we're very excited to have him. He's got a little over 20 appearances for Canada right now. First cap was back with Russia, I think, back in 2016. And he's doing some good things over there in France. Matt, welcome to the Canadian Rock. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's jump right into the questions here. So you grew up in Oakville, Ontario, a little suburb just outside Toronto, which is the self-proclaimed hockey mecca of the universe. Talk to us how you became involved in rugby, where you're playing nationally and professionally. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you played hockey growing up, maybe you sidestepped that. But what was your pathway, high school, the blues, to where you are now? So always played sports as a kid. Um, and I think when I was, I think I was 12 years old and up until that point, it's always been soccer in the summer and then, uh, basketball, volleyball in the winter. Um, and at 12, definitely starting to fill out a bit more and soccer was, well, for the past few years, soccer was definitely just not that fun. And I, but I didn't know what else to do during the summer because I tried football already, didn't take to it. So... A uh, buddy of mine, he started with the Mississauga Blues. Um, and I didn't know anything about rugby at the time, but he started with the Mississauga Blues because Oakville Crusaders, I think their under 14 program had, I, I think I remember six, six teams. So we thought, you know, it might be a bit busy for us in, in the sense of like newcomers to the sport. So we went to Mississauga Blues and um, pretty new program. I think there was only their, First, uh, second, second year, second year as a club. So went over there. Um, I only watched the first training session um, just to get a feel for it. And then talked to the coaches who at the time, it was um, Mark Smurden, who was um, quite a big influence on my rugby career as, as, when I was younger, for sure. But um, that's, how I, that's how I pretty much got started. Going to practice with a buddy of mine, watch training, Went to like a week or two and then played in this uh, uh, U14 tournament up at Fletcher's Fields 
and since then, you know, I haven't looked back. Like I've, I, and I've loved it. That's pretty much how it started. It, it sounds almost like a way a lot of uh, a lot of past guests have, have started. They just, you know, a friend said, hey, "Let's go try this rugby thing," and and you yeah. kind of stuck with. It. So you show up to that practice, you watch, and then you join. What was what kept you there? What kept you going to the point where now you've played twenty plus with Canada and you're playing pro over in France? I guess when I first started out, I enjoyed it because hmm, I was able to. Like really be part of the game, not just have one specific job, you know, like um, like in football, great example, like if you're on the line, you have one job. Uh, basketball, I had a few more jobs and or th- abilities I can do, but in rugby, at that time, you know, like every, like there was, aside from kicking, obviously like that wasn't really my thing, <laughs> but I mean, other than that, like it was, I could do anything I wanted to do because it was encouraged by, by the, the coaches ahead of the time. And then um, as I got older, I'd say after about like two or three years, figured out Rugby Canada and their senior men's program. And then um, obviously with Ontario age grade, and that was kind of the path. And then um, a few senior players uh, and coaches, it's like, you know, they say like, this is the path that you can, you can potentially go on. Um, and pro rugby wasn't even like mentioned. It was just you know, you can get to Rugby Canada and this is how you go through it by playing age grade for Ontario. Um, so then I think uh, I tried out for my first, for U14 Ontario. I, I, I made the cut, um, but I had to, de- then I had to decline because we already, I think we already scheduled like almost like 80, 80% of our summer was already like booked up in terms of like, um, going to some cottage or going to the, some drive or down to Buffalo or family, whatever, right? Family. Yeah. <laughs> didn't work again, but, um, couldn't commit to it. So I had to decline. And then the following year went back U50 Ontario. Uh, now I'm at prop at this point. Um, and yeah, since then U50 Ontario, uh, U16s then right up to U18s and then, uh, think my first year of Canada U20, no, U17, that was the first year they did the East versus West. I'm not too sure what they do now or what the story is, um, but it was U17, East versus West. Uh, I think it was two games. First game was at Shawnigan Lake, and the second was uh, West Hills, I believe. And then that kind of, I guess, in itself was a, a bit of a trial for the U18s to see if any of the young U17s could make the U18 teams with the guys um, a year above them. Okay. And, um, then on to U20s, and yeah. So I like you said that earlier. Like it's, a, I, I had a lot to do when, when it comes to rugby, and you, you you know you likened it to football or what have you, where you've got you know that offensive lineman job in rugby. As a prop, you're probably one of the, if not the hardest position on the pitch. But you can also run with the ball. You can also score. You can also be involved in back plays if you're stuck. Like, it's just there's so much. It's so dynamic that everybody, yeah. even though you have a specific job, your job is actually the same as almost all the other 14 people on the field. Mm. It's, I like that. Talk to us a little bit about your experience playing pro for, was it POW selectors? POW? How do you say that? Uh, PO. And then the team the, the team name is uh, Section Pell Law. Yeah. That's it. Everyone just calls it Poe. Okay. So what was it like there? That was your first, uh, I guess, dip into the professional realm? Yeah, right out of uh, U20 tournament from Portugal, contacted then. And then I think two or three months later, um, over into Poe, into the academy. Um, For the first year, or not at least for the first, up up until the last month of that first year, it was just only academy with maybe one weekend with a, with a pro team if they needed like an extra body. Um, but the first year was academy. So it was a weird setup because a lot of us, or a lot of, not myself, not myself, but um, a lot of the French boys were still students at the time. So they had schooling in the morning and early afternoon, and then they had the evenings free. So all of our training was after four o'clock. So it'd be gym, four o'clock, and then units, 
after that and then run over to another field and, and do our team session. And that would we probably go from four to um, seven or eight at night and and then just like rinse and repeat through the week and then game on the weekend. Um, so that was first year is different. And then, um, but second year onward, train with the pros um, and didn't get many opportunities in terms of playing too consistently. The first year I got the last three games because of injury. So it was an, opp it was an opportunity, which is awesome. And then the following year, um, we got a new scrum coach, Carl Heyman. He came in and we had a pretty decent relationship. He, he watched some of my film from the previous season and he, I guess he, he liked that I was young and um, I guess he saw something in me, um, saw some kind of potential. So we worked decently close in my first few years. And he was, always, he was I think, the, the one who was definitely pushing to get me on the field or at least just get me into training. Like they weren't, they weren't always big on having the academy guys just to, just there to fill spots of the pro squad. They wanted them, at first at least, they wanted them there if they were going to be able to compete and push for a spot. That kind of changed later on. Um, but um, but yeah, Poe kind of sparsed out with playing opportunities throughout the four, four years, and then in the last year, um, probably my most most games I think I got around like nine games in the season and that was more more or less my time Pope. so it was a good experience for sure it sounded like you've, you learned quite a lot and that brought you to where you are now with cast and you're there with Tyler Ardron Tyler's been on a couple times uh, we were talking before we were recording uh, I, I want you can you walk through that for the listeners too your your experience playing against Toulouse, uh, Toulouse yesterday so you you had a good match yesterday now you're on the couch resting up a little bit Talk to us about uh, that atmosphere, because that, that, that was really cool. I wish I, wish I could, um, wish I was able to get some kind of video or recording, because where the stadium is, the, um, the way you enter uh, with the bus, you just go down this long road, probably 100 meters or 150 meters or so. And the, usually what's, when it's, at, well, before COVID, but at the moment now, there's still about, 50 or 100 people there and they're just smashing the drums cheering their hearts out um throwing confetti there's always these two same guys and each one of them one of them has a white like a white smoke grenade and the other one has a blue smoke grenade and they pop those off and then like they just cover the entire road with smoke and then you usually see like in a, some video the bus just rolls right through the smoke <laughs> and the people are just screaming like that like they they love it they they live for rugby here so you always get them like slapping your head or back or something like that if they can if they can just like reach out to you they do that um so that's kind of like how we enter into the stadium and then during the game each four all four corners of the stadium is just packed with these people like standing on top of uh painter ladders that they put plywood on to like support it. They put uh, these temporary beams or support beams in their work van to just so that the roof doesn't cave in with all the people standing on top of it. You know, so that's more or less the, the atmosphere. It, it's not quite, it's definitely not anything like a home game would feel if you play in cast. And uh, I'm assuming what you, it would be like when you play against Toulouse. Um, but it, it, it's as close as you can get to having like a real home atmosphere. With with uh, with what the supporters do nowadays, you're kind of saying like when you guys play Toulouse, it's like the Battle of Alberta for hockey or the Battle of Ontario for hockey. It's like such close, fierce rivals, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's rivalry, and there's a few boys on the team here that are that are from Cass. For them, it is it, it's it's like maybe you have like the top 14 final or, or getting to the playoffs, which is which is huge for them. Um, but those are up here, and yes, but you still have, like, any game against Toulouse, it's on par. <laughs> it is as important, or if not sometimes, like, the make or break of a season. <laughs> I've been told by a few guys here that cast fans look at a, a season as a, 
in a whether it's a um, successful or unsuccessful season in two ways. If we get to the playoffs, it's a successful season. And if we beat Toulouse, it's a successful season. And if we get to the playoffs and lose to Toulouse, they're still happy, but there's just that loss to Toulouse. They, they hate it. For it stinks. Told, you know? <laughs> and so if we don't get to the playoffs, I've been told they're more, they're almost, they're, they're, okay, they're more okay with us not getting to playoffs, but rather than we lose to Toulouse. They, we, like, they need us to beat them. So they put on a, or the club put on a video for us before the game as we were in the changing room and we listened to it. And it was full of staff members <clears throat> um, from Cast Olympic, um, past players, coaches, um, and then a bunch of different fans. And then also some um, government employees of the town. And they are, they're just, you know, words of encouragement, how much this match means to them. Also has to do with a lot of, um, <clears throat> like giving the town hope, something to kind of get yeah. behind. It's, it's like, it is, it's, it's huge. huge. It's really huge. It's um, actually yesterday, probably after yesterday, it's probably the best way to describe it is, is um, for some people playing for cast and starting to feel that way myself is you, it'd be like playing for your, it'd be like playing for Canada. It's, it's that kind of feeling wow. for these guys, for the boys that are from, from cast. It's that, it's like me when I go back to play for Canada, it means something. And it means yeah. something these boys when they play for cast in cast against to lose, of course. All right. So, so if, if I, I'm a teacher, so, you know, I mean, teachers, we make decent money, but we're not, we're not rich. If I saved up and I'm going to go to France in 2023, would it be better for me to get rugby world cup tickets or tickets to match to, uh, to lose and cast? Oh, <laughs> does it, it depends who the world cup games playing, I guess. Right. Who it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good question too. <laughs> uh, you don't have to answer that. You might, you might get in trouble if you answer that <laughs> I would definitely back um, a non-COVID cast versus Toulouse home game, um, like as a huge match and a great atmosphere to be a part of. I would definitely say that'd be huge, though it also depends on what World Cup match you're going to go see. Because that's fair. Yeah, I would definitely <laughs> go. I would definitely go to the World Cup match. <laughs> so how how is how is that environment and cast? How has that been helping you as a player? It was, it has been um, quite different from, from any other environment I've been part of. Like not even thinking about um, environments from back in Canada, other than obviously playing in the rugby in Canada environment. Uh, it's even the Poe environment and now to the cast environment. It, it's just completely, you can't even compare it in the sense like it's, it's, it's really in, intense here um you know not that boys are well some some do every now and then or more often than uh <laughs> that probably be a little bit more often than you'd probably prefer but um but boys are definitely more on top of each other here like at Poe it kind of reminded me of with Rugby Canada not that it's soft but boys are just a little bit more easy going um, Canadian. not as yelling and not as niggly, you know, but the boys here, like, are not afraid to get into it with each other. Um, I know, I remember last season, not too much this season, maybe a couple flare-ups, but nothing too crazy. The last season, uh, Taylor Paris was here, and he said that, like, when you go into unit sessions with, uh, with the boys, just watch, if you, like, watch who you step on, and, and watch your back because you just never know if someone's just having a bad day and that's like their time to bring it out. And a couple of times, like there is definitely a couple, a couple dust ups. Uh, I'm not even going to include jersey grabbing because that like, doesn't count. But a couple dust ups last season, and you're just it's just tense. Different like, intensity. Everyone is just competing and just pushing each other and pushing the boundaries, especially when it gets. Uh, into a situation where some boys haven't been playing for weeks on end and it's uh, like the playing team versus team black and it just gets, it just gets niggly. So being in that environment, I, I, I reckon it's been way better being part of that than an environment where it's just, you could just say if it's softer, you know, like I don't 
take part in the like, dust ups or jersey grabbing. I no one no one comes at me with it. I don't bring it on to anyone else. But it's good to be <clears throat> it's good to be kind of part of that and just see it. A little bit a little bit edge to training. Yeah, I would have said that actually. If, like a probably the beginning of the season, I would have said like I don't think it's good. But as the season's gone on, like it maybe it's transitioned. Maybe it's like transitioned into matches in a positive way because we've had some better results now. Um, Potentially but, pushes players to be better. I would say so. I would say that now, at least for yeah. sure. You know, like like RC, um, like there's never any of that. And maybe it's not necessary. Maybe it's not necessary. You know, for RC. But you know, I, I'd be interested to see if it were to happen, like a few dust ups or a lot more jersey grabbing or some chirping or something like that. If it would help in a positive way, then I'd be. I'd be I think you're. I think you're right there. If it helps in a positive way. So, I mean, you know, it's one thing to have a little dust up on the pitch, but as long as the, the boys can separate afterwards, like, you know, that was, that was there, it was the heat of the moment. But, and I think that's one of those things that rugby does have over some other sports is that, pit, you know, the game's done, the practice is done. We're back. We're, but we're brothers again. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're gonna have to go into the changing room after, after training and you have to share that for the rest of the season, however long you're here for, you don't want to like be avoiding that guy every time you go to say hello to the boys and, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. It, like, but it's, it's also unnecessary. Like, yeah. like, all, like most of the guys here are grown, are grown men, you know, like there's no pettiness or any kind of that kind of BS. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that uh, World Cup back in Japan, a year and a half back. Uh, <clears throat> it was your first foray into World Cup. Um, one of the things I was, when I was looking at some stats and stuff, uh, I watched that South Africa match from start to finish and you came on in the second half and it was like a night and day game. What can you talk to it? Can you talk to us about that game and, and what it meant to the, basically the second half, it was, uh, it was a tie game and we still lost 66 to seven or something like that. But can you talk to us about your experience at the world cup, that South Africa game, maybe in particular, how did that help you as a player? Like, what did you learn from all that, all that experience? I haven't thought about that game in a little while now, but after the world cup, uh, me and Taylor Paris, we did a, a talk show with the the cast uh, radio show here, and, we, and they asked the same question. And I think um, at the moment, I think um, I just tried to take away, like looking at the match after the fact, I mean, I just tried to take away like just little tricks, like in terms of scrummaging, just how, like how quickly you have to get into, into like a, like a strong position to, to be effective. Um, and it was funny. I was looking at my, I was looking at a video, I was deleting like just garbage off my phone. And I saw one video, um, it was from a scrum session during the World Cup. And I looked at my setup and I was just thinking like, I hope to God that I was not actually doing that in games. <laughs> and I, think I, I think I actually then looked at some footage on YouTube the other day. I was like, I mean, yeah, I did. That's that sucks, but it's that kind of thing. It's like for for one for one example is just looking back at that game, and like when I came on, uh, like the boys, like collectively, it was a, it was a game, like way different energy. But I myself, like I was getting put on skates and scrum. So I look back on that, and I was just like. I always see hate, hate being pushed back. No front rower does, mm -hmm. or second, like no forward does. No one likes being part of that. So looking back at that game, how can I be better? What can I do better? Talking to coaches, that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of an open field, just like, yeah, like staying, like lear learning to just stay switched on at every moment. Because definitely my one of my tendencies was on defense, like if I'm maybe lining up first receiver, whether it be 10 or forward or whatever, and then they forward pulls out the back and then they go, they go through the hands. I tend to, or maybe people in general tend to drop off the line. And then if you play against a, a good rugby team like South Africa, they see that you drop off and then they cut back on the inside and they take advantage of that space you've created. And just trying to remember not to do like those little things that give a team opportunity mm -hmm. and I still I, mean, I, I still do it today but not as much as I used to when I look back on videos it was pretty it was pretty bad when I look back on it now but 
just looked at that match in the Italian game, you know, looking at those games and just like, what did I do wrong? And just trying to, and just trying not to repeat those same mistakes or, and that's pretty much all I think at this point, that's all I can do about it. Well, it's good too, that you can, you know, you have some of that footage you can recognize it's, this was two years ago. I'm two years older, two years stronger, two years more mature. And I can make those adjustments at cast and moving forward with team Canada. So it's, it's, it's a great learning tool and it's great that you can recognize it and, and start working on those little errors to help your game, which helps your game at cast, which helps your game with Canada. So I think, I think that's, I think that's all great, Matt, for sure. Let's take a look at, you know, it's back on this side of the pond there, you know, the MLR is catching fire. Um, it's just high scoring matches. There's not a lot of defense, but there's some big tickets names that come over. What do you personally think? I'm not sure if you're able to watch any over, the, uh, you know, any of the MLR games, but what do you think that can do for rugby in Canada? Having, you know, a lot of your Canadian teammates now getting a chance to play in a professional atmosphere. How is that going to help? Is it going to help? I think it could only help. I really, I really hope it can only help. But um, in terms of like a pathway, it's definitely like it's a much, it's more like a, a, a clear and maybe tiered pathway than it was before. Or whatever, you know. Like now, from my understanding, if you go from like U twenties or even before that U eighteen, we had the Canadian Pacific Pride program. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think it goes from like eighteen to. 22 or something like that so you have those groups of players um and a lot of those guys then get to go to different mlr teams what, like wherever the hell they want to go or whoever wants to take them um so that's one having that pathway is really important and then it just makes it easier for the, the selectors for rc to pick a really strong team because now all their guys all their main guys are playing professional rugby maybe it, it, it's not it's it, it's maybe it's not like france england or the southern hemisphere you know it, it's not maybe there yet but it's professional rugby it's being in a training environment seven five, five days out of the week realistically um and just constantly working on the finer details and just trying to hone some skills you know before before i'm alarm um if you're an RC player, you had to move out west. You had to kind of grind, more or less. You know, like, from my understanding, pay wasn't the best. Boys had to worry about rent, food, and having fun outside of rugby, because if you don't have any fun outside of rugby, it gets pretty pretty boring. But, um, you know, so it was just a bit more of a difficult pathway. And you have those boys training out there, but not all of them would get picked. And then when they don't get picked, they're kind of just – stuck there what do you do now yeah but now with mlr i think i, I don't want to say how many guys i think are the mlr because i'm not too sure but it's a, it's a good a number of canadians isn't it yeah there's a good number for sure there's uh there's most of most of the toronto arrows roster is and then there's uh you know upwards of five probably maybe i'm, I'm just spitballing for most of the clubs uh, outside of that so there's a, there's a good chunk of canadians spread out through i think there's 12 teams this year so that's a good number and then you, you look at you know yourself and and tyler over at cast you've got evan olmstead um with uh and oh geez he's in france too and yeah yes yeah. yeah so i mean we've got we still have players kind of spread around the globe uh, is it something that you think someday that, yeah, I want to come back and play in North America where I can be closer to home or, you know, closer to rugby Canada when those times come up? Or, I mean, that could be maybe a few years down the road. Maybe it's something you can't say because of contract issues as well. Like, I, I don't know, but uh, what, what are, are your thoughts? Or like you, this, I, I think the MLR is, is taking, uh, catching fire even during COVID. Uh, the fact that they have this app, it's the rugby network and you can watch every game for free. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm watching yeah. some of the games on. Yeah, and if I try and watch you guys, I can't find a stream anywhere. So it's like, because I've told Tyler a few times, like, send me send me some links so I can watch games. He's like, I don't know where to get them on either. So, uh, I, I can send you a couple links. I would love that. I would love that. I think if you if it has to do with uh, regional codes or whatever, I can... VPN. VPN will work. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I have a couple of those. They work for awesome. my friends and family. I would love that, yeah. It's, 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 I, I love watching rugby and I love when I get to watch rugby for people that have been on the podcast, cause it helps me 
one, understand you a little bit better. Plus I, I love cheering for people that have, have, are taking the time to ha- just have a conversation with me, which is awesome. So, yeah, all right. So we're at a section now, Matt, and I, I didn't cue you for this beforehand. I apologize. Uh, but you did say you listened to a few pods, but we're at our quick fire section. So I've got about 20, I've got about 20 questions here. Half to do with rugby, half kind of to do with your personality. Uh, is it something you want to try and take on? Yeah, yeah, we're not. All we're right. Sure. So let's jump right in. So I say it's quick fire. Uh, a few people have said you've got to rename it because they actually think harder on these questions than some of the other ones. So <laughs> this is this is I usually where I cookie one and I'm like, oh, that's actually no brainer. I'm not gonna lie, that's a no brainer for me. <laughs> Well, th- this is the one where I usually do more editing than anything because there's a lot of there's usually a lot of pauses between answers and questions. So. Right. All right, let's start off with the rugby ones. Matt, who's the best team you've ever faced? South Africa. South Africa, 2019. Yeah. 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 Best player you ever faced? It could have been a front row prop against you, but maybe it was uh, maybe there's somebody stood out in the backs too. Like I don't know. Um, yeah, that's a diff. That is a difficult one. <laughs> I'll keep it front row. I don't know. I don't know his name to be fair, but I just remember against South Africa, whoever their loose head was, this guy was like really good at scrum. He was, was it very talented. Either like Stephen Kitsoff or maybe the Beast or something like that. No, not the Beast. I didn't. He wasn't in that. I don't think he was in that game. But Kitsoff, oh, I did. Oh, actually, no, no, it was Karl Marx. It wasn't. He wasn't loose head, but he okay, yeah. won. Best player I've ever played against. Yeah, he's a he's a wicked player. The front row. Yeah. All right. Toughest player you ever faced, and when I say this, I I, I mean it's you're looking up. It's a one v one, and you're just hoping the guy drops the ball or his boot falls off or something. You, and you don't. I know as your front row, you probably don't want to admit that. You know, you, you're you might be a little intimidated by somebody, but is there anybody? Yes, Vasily Yato. It's this um, Fijian back rower who plays at Claremont. And he, he plays for the Fijian national team as well. But, man, I, I remember playing this guy um, my first year in France. And we, I was in the pod off nine. I was a third man. Ball was going to the second man. And as soon as he touched the ball, this guy, Vasiliato, is just spear-shaped, <laughs> flying at him, like perfectly. Like, like not shoulder charge or anything, just a perfect tackle. And I literally heard the wind get hit out of his body. Oh. The sound he made was <laughs> sickening, frightening. I, at that time, I didn't want any part of any kind of contact around that guy. He was just an animal, an absolute animal. And, and nowadays, he still does it to people that are of all shapes and sizes. And he's fast as hell, too. Like, he's a crazy athlete. It's, he's, it's, he's definitely the guy. It's funny because like half the people that have answered this question, about half of them will actually name another Team Canada player that kind of intimidates them in all the training. And the other half, they always seem to tend to go to a Fijian. It's, yeah. It's crap. Yeah. yeah. Right. I had a opponent is the same kind of guy, but <laughs> they're, special, they're special athletes. Matt, what's the best match you were ever a part of? Could have been high school, could have been blues, could have been with Poe. A difficult one because there's definitely a couple that come to mind, but they were losses. They were great matches to be a part of, but they were a loss. I, no, I, I think about this match a bit every now and then. It's it is a it's a a bittersweet memory, but uh, it was the final for academy the, the academy championship. Um, it was Poe. I think it was 2017. It was Poe versus Claremont, and. We, we lost. It was a t- it was a tight game. I, I, like I, I'm pretty sure it was within within a penalty I'm, from what I remember. But it was just something that we've been pushing for for the past I think two or three seasons. You know, it was just something that was just there. We couldn't get to the final. We couldn't get to the quarters or the the playoffs. I mean, and then this year we we get to this we get to the the quarters. We win. We get the semis, we win, and now we're in the finals. It was a huge moment, and we lost it. That sucked, but it was unbelievable to be a part of that. I like the fact that even though it was a loss, you still can take something out of it and, and uh, still cherish that a little bit. That's good. What's your favorite rugby tradition? Beers and post-match food after the game in the changing room, I'd have to say. Yeah. Um, 
That's a good one. I like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like especially especially after yesterday, you know, they they brought out great fried chicken, pizza, and, and sushi. And, you know, like, <laughs> like it's pretty. Like I'm a big fan of that. So yeah, pretty nice. That's good. Yep, that's a good tradition. I like that one. Who's the best team you ever played with? Be careful, you might offend some of your old teammates. Best team ever played with. I'd have to say I'm really liking the team I'm playing on right now, to be honest. Like I love playing for RC, don't get me wrong. Like I love going yeah. back on tour and being with the boys and, and wearing the jersey. But right now for the past two years, like it, it it's been real enjoy it's been really enjoyable here, you know. Good. So well, that's what you want. That's what you want, right? Yeah, if it wasn't that case, that'd be pretty, pretty uh, a little bit depressing that it, you don't like it here. So I'm happy that it's a good one. Matt, what's your nickname? Evan. Evan loves. Uh, Evan loves this one. Uh, Psycho T. Psycho T. Yeah. <laughs> Is yeah. there a backstory to that? <laughs> uh, you know, it was actually created by by Rumble, uh, Lucas Rumble. Has he been on the show? I've been trying to get in touch with him, and he, he just won't respond to my messages. Reach oh. out to him for me. <laughs> yeah, have him on the show. Um, and we were roommates back in uh, um, U twenties when we were out. When a few, there's a group of us living out in Victoria. No, living out in Victoria, Langford area, whatever. whatever uh, prepping for U twenties, and me and Rumble were roommates. And uh, like I'm a quieter person, not a big chatter. Uh, we were roommates, but we kept we kind of kept to ourselves. But we were living in this like uh, like bachelor basement apartment, and uh, and at the end of it, yeah, I got the name Psycho T, just because uh, I guess a bit quieter. <laughs> and since then, since then, it's just stuck. And, and to be fair, I haven't like I'm not I haven't had many nicknames. To my knowledge, to be fair, <laughs> but um, I don't mind that one. I get a bit of a crack out of it, actually. <laughs> All right, Matt, who's the player that you love to smash? I've had a few people just, you know, give me a position they like to take on, but some people have actually, you know, called somebody out. Sometimes it's a teammate that they just love to get their hands on in practice. A few people say Gordon McCrory, which was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> I got nine. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess. <laughs> oh, man. I guess it's fair. I guess I could. I couldn't call out anyone in particular. Um, Please don't say scrum half. Everybody picks on the scrum halves. I would, I would have to say if I give if if there was a scrum half that no. was <laughs> yapping and just being a classic scrum half and just pissing off the boys or myself. Yeah, I would definitely like to get my hands on him in a game. But you want him on your team, though, right? Those are the best ones to have. Yeah, that's right. And, I mean, we have one of them here. We're talking. <laughs> You know, like that guy, he is exactly that kind of scrum half. I'd hate to play against him, but I love having him on. Like, I'd, I'd much rather him be on my team than the other way around, you know. But, but Now, when he's mouthing off at the other team, are you sticking up for him? Well, you have to. Yeah. I mean, I've been in a situation where um, he's mouthed off while I'm, like, there, and you have to, like, intervene like, back. But there was a moment last year against Claremont where I think we – we scored a try, I think. And um, Rory was picking up the ball off the ground and then kind of just, like, gives um, gives this one guy a little pat on the head, a little, little head rub. And uh, the guy gets up and just open hand smacks him in the face. <laughs> and they played over in slow-mo again and again and again. And it was just, I mean, it just got funny and funnier, if I'm to be completely honest. Yeah. Um, his whole face shifts a little bit in <laughs> slow-mo. Um, but yeah, like that, like that's, that's Rory, like that's the kind of stuff he does. And then in that situation, of course, the boys, they had his back and it was a, another dust up kind of, but nothing serious happened anyway. But, uh, yeah, that kind of nine would definitely be the one. Thankfully for me, I wasn't, I wasn't that yappy when I played nine, but you know, my memory's a little, my memory's a little foggy. So maybe I was, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Any rugby superstitions? It's weird. I tried to develop superstitions or as in like a terms of like a habit when I was younger. But nowadays, as long as I get pregame shower, ankle strap, shoulder strap. Do like, your hair. Yeah, you got to get in the, like a nice tight bun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as I like, yeah, pregame shower, ankles tape, shoulders tape. That's about it for me. 
like I don't I think music is nice but I mean I've gone a couple times where I forget my music and like it, it's just music it doesn't really affect my game or my prep for my game anyway so yeah that's about it okay as much as I can all right well now now we're into the serious component of the uh of the quick fire so we're going to start off hard world domination axe throwing contest who are you taking with you who are your three teammates for world domination in axe throwing have you been know. axe throwing i have not you get try well, it well we, we were in my at my uh my grandparents schoolhouse it's a couple hours north and my grandfather, he had his old hatchet and we got like a sheet of plywood. And it was just me and my dad and my brother just passing time and made a cross song, you know, like who can come the closest. Um, I would definitely take, I feel like Andrew Quatrin would be pretty decent at it. I don't know why. I just get that vibe. He's a hooker, right? Yeah. 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 Who else? Oh, Jason Momoa. It was his teammates or just his people in general? It could be anybody. Jason Momoa was a good shout. Yeah. He'd probably throw it right through the board though. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and someone that would just be funny to watch, I, I'd like to say uh, DJ. I, I, I think I would just be a good crack at watching him uh, <laughs> act, throwing axes. I think it would just crack me up. Don't think he could do it? I think, maybe, I, I think I think he would hit it, for sure. I think it would just be so funny, because it was, <laughs> we, went, we went to the shooting range when we were in the States, and we were shooting some gun, and he kept on, like it was just a tiny gun, so you couldn't really aim down the sights. And he kept on shooting the shooting the target in the lower region, and uh, and how we came up with the name uh, John Dick for <laughs> instead of John Wick, and we just you know so stuff like that. I feel like I get a good crack out of uh, watching DJ do that. That'd be fun. That'd be good. All right, I'm not sure if you'd win the tournament or not, but it'd be a good group to have with you there by the sounds of it. I don't mind that at all. What's your most used app on your phone? Instagram. Instagram. What's your go? YouTube. What's your, YouTube. Yeah. Just rabbit holes like crazy. Yeah, yeah. I've been going down one. Uh, it's I'm not a woodworker, but I love watching woodworking videos. Okay. So I've just been watching. Like I'll like it'd be like trying to get to bed around eleven o'clock, and it's now like one o'clock in the morning, and I've watched like twenty different like. <laughs> epoxy pours or some like cool table or something, like stuff like that like those are like those are the rabbit holes i've been going down lately okay that's or fair. clips which are pretty popular i think but yeah those <laughs> you, they're just endless what's your go-to food oh anyway, if anyone knows who's listening to this right now they know it's it's pizza <laughs> i uh, yeah like that's my go-to yeah like, like i had it last night after you know, like I, all week I was like, yeah, like after the game, get a come home, get like, a, like make a nice pizza, get the ingredients. Like that was my thing. So homemade pizza. Oh yeah, I love nice, it. nice. Anything odd? Like, what do you put on there? Is there anything in, you know that's special about your pizza? I think it, it's not odd here. It's quite popular. But when I tell it to my friends and family back home, they they look at me like, why would you do that? But um, it's it's um, goat cheese and honey pizza. Goat cheese, I can see, but the honey, I'm not sure. Oh, it, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, here it's called creme fraiche. I don't know what that is. Um, I don't know what that translates into. Fresh in cream? You know, that's what it's <laughs> into, but I, I, don't I don't know what the hell it is. But it's if, if any of the French listeners know what that is, could you please let us know? Just send us a message on Facebook or Instagram or something. <laughs> Typically thin crust, creme fraiche base. Um, mozzarella cheese and then little you can either like slice the goat cheese or just like, like kind of like piece it off so you get a bit more spread yeah and then i go i put it in the oven um and then once i take it out start in the middle of the honey and then just circular just pour it to the to the crust nice and it's my it's my go-to pizza and i told my family about it and i made it for them and they're like never had this before in my life but it's pretty pretty good Do you put chicken or beef on it or anything or is it just nope just the goat cheese and the honey and the sauce goat cheese honey mozzarella as the cheese base uh and the sauce and that's it no oh, i might try that all right chips or cookies cookies what kind oh yeah if they're like that soft like 
don't know if it's right to say molasses -y type yeah. of cookie, like that cookie. Okay. I'll, I'll have a, a lot of those. <laughs> well, French fries or onion rings? Breaded or battered onion rings? Ooh, uh, your call. If it's battered onion rings, it's it definitely, yeah, it's battered onion rings over fries. Um, if it's breaded, I'll go, with, I'll go with fries. I like the fact that you're taking these questions more seriously than the rugby ones. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite beer? I really like, uh, there's a there's a beer here that's, I, don't know, I just can't remember the name, so I'll, I'll pass that. But back home, I love um, Coors Banquet, but I think it's called Coors Original now. Okay. I don't know if that's... Right I think so. it's like a yellow can or something like that, yeah. I think. Yeah, that one. I love it. I think it's fantastic. Of course. Okay. What's a guilty pleasure? Sounds like pizza, but... Ice cream. Ice cream? Any kind? Yeah. Like, doesn't matter? Or is there a specific flavor? I guess it depends on the moment. Isn't it? Uh, <laughs> when I'm over here, there's no, like there's McFlurry or McDonald's, but they suck. So really, <laughs> there's no Dairy Queen or anything like that. Yeah, there's no, there's no DQ, Baskin Robbins, whatever else, whatever else there is. Um, but when I'm back home, yeah, I, ser I search out the nearest DQ. Peanut and butter I, parfaits. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> I went back home one summer and the DQ got turned into a Starbucks. So that was disappointing. disappointing. <laughs> Yeah. As I was pulling up, I see a Starbucks and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I guess I'll get a coffee while I'm here instead. Where's the best place for a post-match beer? I think I know the answer because you kind of alluded to it earlier. but In the sheds after a game? Yeah, I thought that's uh, what you were going to say. Yeah, you know, everyone, every place has their special, but, you know, like, it's always the same. Like, the atmosphere is usually the same. Obviously, after the win is yeah. the best. Well, it's always the same. Okay. What's your favorite song or band? Like if you had a theme music for when you're entering the pitch, just for you, what would it be? I don't know. I've been, I've been listening to uh, Nickelback and like My Chemical Romance and that kind of genre of music. So I don't, I don't know what song exactly, but. Okay. Uh, Nickelback. Music, something like that. Like okay. Nickelback. What series are you watching, binge watching right now? I am watching Parks and Recreation for like the <laughs> fourth time. Um, I watched something on Prime Video not too long ago. And I, I oh, that's it, um, Yellowstone. Yeah, that one's wicked. My parents told me about it and they compared it to like Game of Thrones by yeah. Montana. I tell and people it's like Sons of Anarchy with horses instead of motorbikes. That's a much better way to describe it for sure. It's a wicked series. Well, I can't wait for the, the next series to come yeah. out. Down the days. What's your favorite movie? I don't get tired of watching within reason. Oh, that's a real hard one. <laughs> I was thinking to myself the other day, like that that's a that's a definite that's a definite question, but I cannot think of one. I'll keep it to comedies, just make it easy. You seem like a like a dumb and dumber kind of guy. I actually I hate that movie. Oh <laughs> <laughs> my, my oh. Best friends, they quote that movie. Uh, like they, they just know the movie off by heart and when we were younger that's all they would quote and I never saw it and so all they would talk about whenever like something that reminded me of this scene for a movie happened they would just like quote something from the movie and I was just like man this movie like you stop talking about this fucking movie for god's sakes and uh, they, they showed it to me one day and most part didn't enjoy it probably out of spite but there was one scene that I, I, I was on the floor, rolling, crying, laughing. I thought it was hilarious. It was some, it was something to do with like our pets' heads are falling off because the guy bit off the pigeon or bird's head. You know that scene. I thought, I just thought maybe a bit, you know, a bit weird like that. But I just thought that <laughs> I'll, I'll say uh, I, lo I love the Hangover. I love the first Hangover. Yeah, that's a good one. The first one's good for sure. Yeah. All right, three quick fire questions left. Who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life? I'll try and compliment myself, or do I just? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell people Russell Crowe. You know, he owned a rugby team. He played in a hockey movie, so he's got athletic background. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah. Um, hmm. You go Keanu Reeves with the hair. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good one. I, I, my, <laughs> this, this this might be like weird. But my mom said. You remind me of somebody, and then I was thinking like, I don't, who do you think? Who are you thinking of? And she's like, some guy from this TV show. And I'm like, okay, that's a good one. Yeah, I don't know what you mean still, but she's yeah. like, 
he was Aquaman. And I'm like, oh, you don't mean Jason Momoa. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's a guy. Right. Yeah. You could have him as your, as your, uh, you know, play as a movie, but he might not be able to go ax throwing if you're, if you're making that comparison. I don't know. Nah, I don't know, but I'll, I'll go with Jason. Momoa. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Take that. Yeah. All right. Who would be the leading lady? Yeah. This one's harder. Oh. Do you go with Amber Heard who was in Aquaman? No. Do you not go with her. Scarlett Johansson? Like, I don't know. Blake Lively. Blake Lively. That's a good show too. All right. Last one. What would the movie be called? Um, these, are tough. these are definitely tough questions. These are yeah. tough. See, I just have to rename it, you know, from quick fire to deep and pensive thoughts or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Watch at your own discretion. Ah, I like that. Watch at your own discretion. It comes with the warning label right on the title. I like that. That's good. Yeah. All right. Just, we just have a few questions left here, Matt, and we'll finish up. Who had the biggest impact on you as a player? Started off with Mark Smerden. He was my first RB coach at Mississauga Blues. And for age grade, he was there the entire time up until me leaving France. Um, and then when it came, you know, he was like a huge, he played a huge role on the club side for Mississauga. Um, having that kind of like a, like a quality coach at that level was huge. And then moving to rugby Ontario, Mike Curran, Mike Curran for sure. Um, he was he was at Mississauga Blues as well. He was there from me kind of starting off with rugby. Um, but then he told me about he was he was kind of the one that pushed like tried to show me the path <laughs> the path of uh, getting to like rugby Ontario and Canada and, and and whatever else comes after. You know, so it was him, it was Mark Smurdy and Mike Curran, and then it was Tyler Leggett. Um, he runs this um, skills academy called Upright Rugby. Um, and I think they're now big into developing sevens players. I think they still do the, like the academy, like just the basic skills and stuff like that. Um, but those three guys, they were huge for me. With Tyler, it was just working on basic skills, not uh, outside of contact for insurance purposes, but um, like catch pass, running lines, just Play, just trying to like read the game, understand it as best awareness, as could, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Awesome. Uh, so he was, he was like my guy during winter that like, and he was a, he was a huge influence. All three of those guys, you know, I don't, I personally don't think I'd like be over in France or maybe even playing rugby Canada. If, if, if one of those three guys weren't, wasn't in my life when I started playing out rugby. That's awesome. That's great. Hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll, they listen to this when it's, uh, when it gets posted. In your mind, Matt, what's the biggest difference between rugby and other sports? Like, how would you convince someone to give rugby a try? For you, you you, you kind of went to a practice and watched, and then that sparked an interest. Like, what would you do to tell other people, like, give rugby a try, this is why? I would, defi I would definitely highlight the fact that, like, if you're looking for, like, a community to really be a part of and a really good group of people, you know, like, just to – be part of something, I would definitely try and drive that point home. You know, like I look at um, Oakville Crusaders, you know, like I, like I don't know of any, like um, I don't know of any other club that has that kind of um, community aspect, you know, like I never played for them, but my brother and sister did. So I would go there on the weekends and watch them play. And, you know, like on, I think on Saturdays, it was just, it was literally Saturday is a rugby day there, you know? So you have like all the mini rugby starting in the morning, all the way through the day, age grades progress and into the men's in the evening. And all day, it's just uh, like bars open, uh, the barbecue's on, there are just burgers and hot dogs being pumped out to people. Um, the bar is flowing. You can be inside, outside, everyone's chatting, mingling. There's families put, pitching up their, their um, those, those chairs, like everywhere, you know, that kind of thing. And that's why I would say like, like this is what you can, this is what you can be a part of if you play rugby, for example, you know, like, like I've played basketball. There's a, it's a, it's cool, but it doesn't, basketball doesn't have what rugby has in that sense. I don't, I don't know of any other sport that, that does really. I think that's good. I like that. 
that's a great way to, I guess, entice people that are trying to find something more than just a sport to play. Try to find, uh, you know, maybe a bit of a purpose or something like that. What are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? That's a good one. Because that's, that's a good one. You know, obviously you want a guy who's like not he's not a piece of piece of crap, I'll say. You know, like you don't want that on the team. It's great to have a, a team of of good, like solid guys that like you like you want to play, you want to play beside, them, you know, that kind of thing. But when it comes to like traits, being a good person is definitely important, but it only goes so far if you know, if your rugby skills are limited, you know, like, like that's no good either. Like um, a good team guy, someone who really like, who will just go like the extra mile to really uh, like to, to put the, the collective goal like above themselves, you know, and that comes like, it, it could be shown in like um, things outside of rugby, you know, in, in, in terms of like the team made up like a, if the team's made a, like a call, like no drinking after the, after this game or the week leading up, you know, like if that's something they want to do, for example, and then like this one guy, he goes out and he gets on the pit, he get, he starts drinking, that kind of attitude, mm -hmm. like it's not some, it's not a quality you'd want to see because it's a bit more selfish. Yeah. You know, someone who's, I guess it's someone, like just someone who's like selfless, works hard for the collective goal, for something bigger than them, I guess it'd be kind of hard to really pinpoint, but no, I someone, get where you're going. Someone like that, yeah, like more, a little bit more selfless, very altruistic to to the club and the club's needs. Yeah, yeah. Now let's fast forward to 2029. It's 10 years past that Japan Rugby World Cup of 2019. You're having a reunion with some of the old mates from that 2019 club, that 2019 Rugby Canada squad. What do you think they're saying about you? What do you, what do you think they're saying about Matt as the player and as a person? What do you want them to say about you? How do you want to be remembered for rugby? Not far down the line yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, how would I want to be remembered? Um, nothing too crazy. I mean, like, I just hope I'd be, like, I'm, I hope at that time they look back and say, like, yeah, like, Matt is just like a salt, like a, a good guy, great teammate. And hopefully that, like, someone that they'd want to play with and they and then they look back and say like yeah i'd still take matt like to be on my team you know like that's it really just like hopefully look back on and then just like it just it's just good memories you know no bs nothing like that just he's a solid dude and and that'd be it for me like that'd be good enough for me mm, i like that that's good nice and simple that's what you want no drama Lastly, Matt, is there, do you have any good rugby stories you can share with us? Something that's uh, fun for the listeners and viewers? Is it, uh, you know, throw an old teammate under the bus, throw yourself under the bus? You're thinking. They're, they are involved in rugby in the sense they're with rugby teammates, but they're not on the field. Um, Those are usually the best ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> um, and, and nothing too crazy. There was one time me and, it was a, it was a poll. Um, uh, we look back on this a lot every, every, every now and then. Um, we were in Poe on a night out, and it was around Christmas time. And I think early in the night, we were talking about how, oh, we should like get Christmas trees like for our apartments, you know, like whatever. And then a few, a few beverages later, we were walking from one bar to the next bar, and we are walking by, we're walking by our, our team's christmas cabin that has all of the merchandise and stuff like that but they have like christmas trees in little pegs outside of it and one of the boys got a bright idea to start trying to like yank on it and, to, and try and take it home and we went over to him we we're like what the hell are you doing he's like i'm getting a christmas tree for the apartment and uh <laughs> and we looked at each other and we're just like and the, at the time we're thinking like man you're a genius <laughs> take it out of the thing me and him are running down, like, I got the trunk and he's got the top, and we're running down this, like, cobblestone road to get these apartments. And uh, our, the third guy is running behind us, picking up all the ornaments that are falling off the tree as we're running. And we get to the apartment, run up the stairs, just shove it in the corner. Because it's funny, we, we lost a stand along the way. And, <laughs> and then uh, two minutes later, our buddy comes back with, like, all these, like, ornaments. <laughs> 
and he just like dumps it on the floor. And we're just like, nice boys. And I think that looks good now. And then <laughs> as we're walking down the stairs, get to go back to the bar, there are just two police cars. <laughs> like, I don't know, like four or eight cops, just arms crossed, looking at us all like, you guys are a bunch of idiots. <laughs> guys get up to anything. And then one of, the, one of the guys said, oh, no, no, we're just, you know, we're just going out to, to the bar. And, we're, and then me and the other guy said, we'll go get the tree. Is that okay? And they said, <laughs> the tree, bring it back down here, walk it back over there and, and don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Steal the Christmas tree from your own club and you get busted. Yeah. <laughs> That's classic. Luckily they, luckily they didn't tell the club about it, which was really nice because I, I'd be much, I'd be much more scared of the, of the club and what they would do than the, what the cops would do over a stolen Christmas tree. <laughs> That's so good. That so uh, are, are they on your Christmas card list now? Like, do you have to make amends now that they probably know the story or send them a donation uh, annually? At this point, I don't care if they know or not, but they're definitely not on the list. <laughs> All right. Listen, Matt, it's been a lot of fun. Really, uh, really do appreciate you taking the time out. I know you're probably resting up from the weekend and stuff. So enjoy the rest of your Sunday and, uh, you know, and, and best of luck finishing off the season with cast and, and uh, moving forward with Rugby Canada. I nice. appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. Cheers. All right. Thanks, Matt. That was a lot of fun. Good laughs. Good stories. Really enjoyed it. Best of luck the rest of the season with Cast. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys continue to play well, and uh, you, you know you quit you quit stealing Christmas trees. I, I don't think that's uh, I, it's funny as hell. I guess. What what am I saying? <laughs> Coming soon. We've got Matt Evans, Tom Woods, and I are still looking for that date. Elisa Allaire and I are trying to set a date up. We got that Women's Rugby World Cup 2014 roundtable coming, and we've got local legends Oakville Crusaders on tap, which is trying to set up some dates. Anyway, from there, just want to say thanks everybody for listening. Keep spreading the great rugby word, the great Canadian rugby word. Again, got to thank my son Ryland for creating our intro and outro tunes. It's always fun to have him involved in these processes. As always, feel free to request topics for future podcasts where the guests or it's questions and until next time i'm going to show you my little uh, my second coffee mug from my buddy coin at esl art supplies nice canadian ruck but again this is jamie until next time stay safe stay healthy stay sane and most importantly keep on rocking <laughs> <laughs>